My name is Fred Beekle, Sr., M.D. Uh, I practice uh, actively still in South Orange, New Jersey, work out of St. Barnabas Medical Center. And I'm here today to see Dr. Jim Pritchett, uh, my surgeon, who uh, replaced my left hip two and a half years ago with a resurfacing device that I developed back in the mid-80s with Dr. Mike Pappas. Uh, Dr. Pritchett is uh, really probably the most world-renowned resurfacing surgeon uh, that we know today uh, using metal polyethylene bearings, which are really the best bearings that you can use because of the highly cross-linked polyethylene that has a longevity of about 25 to 40 years. So uh, my first hip uh, had gone bad because of uh, femoral acetabular uh, uh, impingement problems. Uh, I originally had a uh, arthroscopic procedure about 10 years before to help trim down the, uh, the bone. And that lasted for about eight years and then I was hobbling and had a uh, poor range of motion. Uh, I came to see Dr. Pritchett and uh, he uh, kindly replaced my left hip, and uh, I've returned to full function in that left hip, including uh, playing squash twice a week and doing uh, hip replacement and knee replacement surgery on a routine basis. Well, hip, hip resurfacing uh, popularity started actually back uh, with John Charnley back in the 1960s uh, when he started his initial hip replacements were resurfacings. Uh, he was using the wrong materials at the time and so it fell out of favor and he went to the polyethylene and, and uh, stainless steel stems that became popular and actually successful. But resurfacing started way back in Boston uh, when cup arthroplasties were used for arthritis and they used a vitalium shell on top of a femoral head and they reamed the socket and the, and the femur at the same time and this shell sort of moved between the two. About 95% of those failed uh, because of constant pain, but 5% of them lasted for 30 years or more. So the concept was okay, but the execution seemed to be a problem. Um, later resurfacings uh, developed in the 1970s in Germany with, with Wagner, in England with Michael Freeman, <clears throat> in America uh, with uh, Bill Capello uh, and Charlie Townley. Uh, and those resurfacings seemed to have some traction, but again, they wore out too fast. The polyethylene wasn't good enough. But interestingly, the femoral heads survived, which meant that resurfacing was a viable concept. It's just we didn't have the proper bearing surfaces. Derek McMinn <clears throat> came up in the 90s with metal-metal uh, metal resurfacings, and he used uh, Peter Ring's original machinists to lap the parts to make sure that they matched perfectly so that they didn't have too much overlap, too little overlap, they were just right, and each, each part was lapped perfectly. And he had great success with this Birmingham hip, as he called it at the time. Other surgeons tried to duplicate that, but they didn't use the special lapping technology and you ended up with failures, metallosis, uh, all sorts of problems with uh, loosening. Uh, they had problems with uh, <clears throat> cysts forming. And so the technique became very popular in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and lots of surgeons were trained on it. But because of the large numbers of failures of the non-Birmingham hips, it's gone out of disfavor in the last 10 years. But I still think that the concept is valid. And now with the, with the, uh, the advance of highly cross-linked polyethylene, the fact that we can use polyethylene bearings against either ceramic or metal uh, femoral components makes the longevity of 25 to, to 40 years viable. So I think it's gonna have a resurgence. Uh, Dr. Pappas and I started in 1982 making metal polyethylene uh, implants uh, using 
regular poly at the time, polished cobalt chromium implants. And then we changed to titanium nitride ceramic in 1989, thinking that this is going to give us an improvement in, in uh, longevity. Well, we did a 48 million cycle simulation that showed essentially no wear after 48 million cycles. But our clinical results were not as good as our, our simulator results. And in very active patients, they tended to wear these out in between five and 10 years uh, post-op. So it was the polyethylene that seemed to be the problem. We used cementless fixation technology both on the femur and on the acetabular side, and this worked really well. So we know that cementless resurfacing fixation works, and it works very nicely. We have some patients that are, are over 25 to 30 years with these cementless resurfacing components. The only thing that we've had to do is change the bearing because it would wear out. But now that we have highly cross-linked polyethylene bearings, it looks like these bearings will go the distance and perhaps be lifetime bearings. So I think resurfacing is gonna come back. There's enough surgeons that have been trained in it in the past using some of the, the more defective metal-metal components, but they still have the skill set. And, and Dr. Pritchett has been doing them for so long that he's really the master of, of this particular technique at this time. Resurfacing is more difficult than a conventional total hip. Conventional total hip, you cut the femoral neck, you have great exposure now of the acetabulum, and so it makes it quite easy to do a hip replacement by, after you've cut the head off. If you have to leave the head on, it's technically more demanding. You have to make a, several important moves to get the head out of the way, to dislocate it anteriorly and superiorly above the acetabulum to get exposure. So learning that technique took quite a while for myself. It took me about five or six years to develop the technique to expose that. Uh, Dr. Pritchett uses that technique routinely now, and so he can do this procedure in, in an hour, an hour and a half, whereas in the old days, it was a four-hour operation, and that limited its ability to be used by the general orthopedic surgeon. So you have to be able to first learn the tricks to get the exposure so that you feel comfortable with what you're doing. A robotic hip surgery uh, will actually make resurfacing hip replacement a lot easier to do. Uh, at least from the bony preparation standpoint. You still have to do the soft tissue exposure part, which I, to me, I think is the most critical part of, of the operation, is doing the surgical exposure. But once you've got your surgical exposure, robotic techniques give you perfect placement. Well, a perfect uh, total hip, if we call it a perfect total hip, meaning you're your trochanter to head center is lined up exactly right, and your acetabular component is, is at the, in the floor of the acetabulum down by the teardrop. That can be done perfectly with, with the robotically controlled instruments. But the resurfacing hip versus uh, a total hip with a stem, that's a different animal. The, the resurfaced hip on, a, on the proximal femur feels like a normal hip because you're loading the normal proximal femur. You don't have the worry of, of subsidence of the femoral component, fracture of the femur around that femoral component. So I think a resurfacing hip is a more natural hip. And so they're both gonna be good. Uh, most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a resurfaced hip and a total hip unless they saw the x-ray. But I think from a technical standpoint, and a, and a functional standpoint, I think the resurfacing hip is superior because it's using all your natural bone and uh, that's always a superior thing in, in my estimation. As I'm still an active surgeon, but I can't do more than two cases a day because my hip hurts. This, this time it's my right hip. My left hip doesn't hurt anymore because it's two and a half years old and it's functioning just fine. Um, but I get fatigued and I, I start to limp and I start to lurch um, after a couple cases. So I'm, I'm actually trying to limit my surgical practice to one case a day because I know I can handle that. Two cases to me is a strain. Whereas in the old days I could do five or six cases, n no problem, uh, but, but not anymore. So I think 
the hip is holding me back. I can't walk more than a couple blocks uh, without starting to lurch and start to ache. Um, and plus I have an x-ray that shows I'm bone on bone, worn out, and I'm stiff. <laughs> I, can, I can't internally rotate at all. And that's, that's it until I hit a painful point. And at that point I have zero internal rotation, maybe, maybe five degree of fixed external rotation. Uh, and my further external rotation goes to about 15 or 20 degrees. So that's, that's all the motion I've got. Uh, whereas my resurfaced hip, which had about that same amount of motion beforehand, this one now comes up as far as I want. Uh, I have a stiff back, but my hip will come up to 130 degrees or more. I can now internally rotate uh, 35, 40 degrees. I can externally rotate probably to 90 degrees, whereas before that I had a similar motion that I had before. So that kind of active motion allows me to continue to play squash uh, once a week now. And it's only because I'm so stiff here I can't get that second game in. But uh, I would say that uh, having, having gone through this first hip and, and seeing you know, the really positive results uh, makes me uh, anxious to get the second one done so that I can uh, get back to maybe doing two surgical cases a day without having to feel completely beat uh, and get back to, to play in some sports. Uh, resurfacing hips allow you to do that. They allow you to be active. Uh, there are a lot of, back when I was doing some of my resurfacings, I had some state troopers from New Jersey that were going on and, and winning rowing championships. They were swimming championships. They were running, golfing uh, with their resurfaced hips. I didn't have my regular total hips doing any of these high activity levels. So I'm fairly convinced that the resurfacing hip is the state of the art. It's the best hip you can get. Uh, as long as your bone is strong enough, I'm happy with my surgeon. And, and I'd say if you're gonna pick an operation, you wanna make sure your surgeon is the right one. You wanna make sure he's done enough of these cases so that he's comfortable, which makes me more comfortable. I am pretty anxious about having this hip done again, uh, uh, but I have a wonderful partner in, in Karen uh, Beekle who's, who took care of me the first time and she's out here to help take care of me again. And so we rented a little condo for a couple of weeks, just about a, you know, a mile or two from the hospital. And uh, we sort of are gonna just make that home uh, for while we're here. So even though we're out of town, uh, I'm happy with, with my surgeon, I'm happy with the hospital. I'm very happy with Karen, who's, who's a wonderful uh, caretaker and, and partner. And uh, so I'm ready to go. Uh, the, the anterior approach um, is, is a, a good possibility for the surgeons that can, can make it work for them. Uh, it has quite a few complications to it. Uh, I don't particularly want to have that particular technique done, um, mostly because of the complications. Uh, so I, in the old days, I used to do anterior approaches uh, myself, but they were the bigger anterior approaches where we would take the abductor mechanism down from the, the lateral wall of the ischium, uh, or of the, from the ilium, and uh, these were big operations. Nowadays, they're fairly small operations, and the surgeons that can pull them off, I give them credit. But the, the, the problems with the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve uh, causing numbness in the lateral side of your leg is not uncommon. Uh, I've had that happen to me after my arthroscopy, so I know I don't like that particular complication. Um, if, if you can find the surgeon that knows how to do that anterior approach, I don't have a particular problem. I don't think anyone is really doing it with a resurfacing type implant. Uh, if they are, Dr. Pritchett, you'll have to tell me that because I think it's, it's, uh, it's difficult enough to try to put in a little short stem through an anterior approach. 
than to try to get exposure for the acetabulum, keep the femoral head intact. And since I'm a resurfacing type of surgeon, I would rather go with a posterior approach, tried and true technique that stood the test of the time over the past 30 years. Uh, whereas this anterior approach is okay if you don't run into a technical problem like a femur fracture, a wound healing problem, a numb thigh, uh, or some other uh, untoward event, which is technically possible. So since I'm getting a resurfacing, I don't even want to think about an anterior approach for a resurfacing. I just don't think we have uh, the surgical techniques down enough to be able to do it. So I'm uh, Dr. Jim Pritchett, and I'm uh, right here in my office in Seattle. I'm a Seattle native. I was born uh, just down the street uh, from where I'm sitting right, right now. And I've been in practice in downtown Seattle for 34 years, uh, my entire time. And uh, I'm married to a plastic surgeon, and she also has an office in this same building, Dr. Mary Lee Peters which is interesting because my first introduction to medicine was working in a doctor's office when I was in high school. I worked for Walter Scott Brown. He was a well-known plastic surgeon of his day. And I'm not sure how that influenced my decision to become a doctor or not, but it may have in, in some way. In fact, he took me over to see one of the very first total hip replacements that was done in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Bob Romano uh, was performing it on a, uh, a, a teenager that had severe rheumatoid arthritis and she was incapacitated and I saw the procedure. It seemed very drastic to me at the time. Um, and I, but I, I'm now actually in the practice that Dr. Romano was in then, so this is <laughs> a good many years uh, later. So uh, it was an interesting turn of events. Um, a, a good bit of my practice is uh, hip resurfacing surgery and about 75% uh, of all patients I treat have uh, various hip problems. A good bit of it are young people with hip dysplasia. Uh, and I do some teaching in the hip fellowship program, I conduct uh, research and do some implant uh, development. Yeah, 34 years, uh, and I'll be starting year 35, July 1. So a, a good bit of time. It's nice to be in the same community because I have a lot of really long-term follow-up now. I have many, many patients with uh, 20 plus years and of uh, follow-up and a good many from when I started and a good many of those have hip resurfacing implants. So I've been able to see the, the long-term effects of, of what we do and um, the things that have worked out generally, it's worked out well and it's a good thing to see your patients back. You know, that's been something that I've been trying to get at my entire career, is to see how to compare a, a total hip replacement to a hip resurfacing. Because these are both really great operations. Uh, in fact, a total hip was defined by Lancet, our, one of our world famous journals, as the operation of the century. That was last century, of course, but uh, it was still really great. It's, and it's really s consistently second only to a cataract procedure as a surgical endeavor. It's, really great. So how can you compare something uh, without a ceiling effect? If you have one really great operation, how do you compare it to another in a meaningful way? And I, people have tried different things. The most important paper that uh, I've written, I, th I think, is the one I'm doing right now. And it's, it's one I could only do pretty late uh, into practice where you have a lot of long-term follow-up. I've finally been able to get a statistically significant group of patients who have one of each type of hip. They have a total hip in one of their hips, and they have a hip resurfacing in their other hip for various different reasons, and they have exactly the same per socket, essentially, this actually the same everything. The same surgeon did their case the same way, the same person. It's all the variables control best way we can. And so we've got a um, researcher who doesn't know what operation the patients had. And I asked, the patients were told not to disclose that as they were interviewed, examined, and then other, otherwise just generate the necessary data to see what, what bubbles up. Well, it's, it's pretty interesting. We had some of the patients, they really didn't have much of a preference between the two. They, they, they looked pretty similar um, to them.
that was only about 9%. Said, you know, they're, they're kind of identical. And there were some that thought the hip replacement was better. Um, that was only, however, about six or so percent thought their hip replacement. And admittedly, all these people had a good hip on each side. If one was bad, they were excluded because it wasn't valid anymore. But all the others said the hip resurfacing uh, hip was, of their two, the better hip to have. It wasn't a smaller incision. It, uh, sometimes they said, would say, though, the recovery was easier. We asked them, you know, why was that? And the most prevalent reason they would give was they could just do more with that hip compared to their other hip. In the end, that was the overwhelming response. Uh, and they would say it felt more natural. It, it felt stronger. It, it felt more like their natural hip had been before it became arthritic. They have a variety of ways of describing that. When they went to use it, it was a pretty consistent theme. If they had a, a preference in one side to the other, which people do just like they have one hand is dominant to another, that would change to the resurfaced side. And they were equally distributed, whether they're right or left um, over time. So of our 270 patients with a, a matched bilateral paired series, uh, it, I think that was the most compelling th thing for me t to hear. I, any other way of comparing it is, is pretty hard to do when people have, have tried. And, uh, so I, probably that's answered it for me and uh, s supports probably the ongoing performance of hip resurfacing, which it's harder to do and uh, it's more troublesome in some ways to, t to take on. A lot of times people want to know, what's a hip resurfacing? That's a very good question. And it's, it's not take your hip out of joint, sand it down, and put it back in like people are thinking. You know, hop in, maybe do it arthroscopically, just a little keyhole. It's a real operation. Uh, I like uh, what Dr. Beagle said about it. He calls it a hip replacement with a resurfacing technique. I think that's a very good way of seeing it. it and that's the, technically correct, too. In our office, it's called a conservative hip implant arthroplasty, and we adopted that from uh, the Indiana conservative hip, which is a popular hip back in the 1970s. That's what the, they called it, and it kind of resonated with, with me. Re the term resurfacing more came out maybe 20 years ago, and it, it was called different things before that, a surface replacement or a conservative hip implant arthroplasty. But it, the operation is a major undertaking. You take uh, the hip out of joint, you make a good size incision to do it, you, you get the, the ball in your, in your hands, uh, you shape it, put a new surface on it, do the same thing with the socket, which is the harder part, put the hip back together, and and then uh, rehabilitate your patient to get it to recover. A hip replacement's uh, very similar. It's another big operation. You, you do take the hip out of joint, but you take the ball off. And there's a real attractiveness to that because now you can get right to the socket without any difficulty at all. You've, you've created a surgical space to work in. You can see well, you can work easily, and you can put any kind of socket you want back in. You don't have to match the patient's natural ball diameter. And the same thing when you put the, their new ball in, you put a, a stem, a, a kind of a spike inside their femur, and then you can put any ball diameter you want back in. It's a blank canvas. You can create a total hip in any way you want. For engineering purposes, uh, right now, 90% of everyone receives a 36 millimeter femoral head. That's really attractive to, to have a very simple, straightforward, commonly performed operation. The trouble is uh, with that is nobody's hip works quite like a total hip. We don't have a metal spike inside our femur ordinarily, and the load transfer doesn't work that way. And we also don't have a 36 millimeter femoral head. Uh, mine's around 50 millimeters. Dr. Beagle's is uh, two. And we, we'll, we'll find out on Monday exactly what his is, but we, we pretty much know now. And it's nowhere near 36 millimeters. So when, he, when you go to use it, if it's not quite right, your brain can tell. And we had our paired bilateral study. We tried to exclude that part of it by comparing similar head diameters uh, to, to get rid of that effect. But if, if you just leave them different, people really notice then. If you keep them the same, it's still, there's an advantage to resurfacing. The brain can still tell the difference, whether it's your natural ball or an artificial one, even if they're the same dimension. So,
Uh, there's, there is a, a big difference between the two operations. Fortunately, they're both great procedures, but they're both expensive and, uh, and they have their share of, of things to look out for and, and uh, landmines to sidestep on either one of them. And hip resurfacing uh, should be someone who needs it. And I look at four things. I look at the age of my patient, the activities they need. Uh, it presupposes they need all these things that it can do for them, that they are active. So we ask them what their goals are. I ask every patient and I know what they are. So they do need to have an athletic lifestyle to, to, to warrant the more complex and difficult procedure of hip resurfacing. Plus the implants cost a little more because they have to match specifically the hip that every patient has. So you have to make a good many more hip resurfacing implants and it just plain costs more to make them in a precision way and to make more of them to have every size that a patient needs. So you have to have a justification for it. It's that athletic lifestyle. It also presupposes they're at least relatively young. And what that means, somebody who has 20 years of a useful life ahead where they need this and they need it for an extended period. If it's somebody who has a limited need, they're older, it's hard to justify the additional time, trouble, and expense of, it, of doing it. They do need to have good bone because we're going to keep all the bone structure and the operation is not any better than the bone structure itself. So that's a key thing. And I look at every patient's bone before I'll get too far into a conversation with them about hip resurfacing. The last and probably the most important thing though is the patient has to have a, a, a good idea of, of what these operations are. If they can't tell the difference, um, I don't have a paternalistic uh, view uh, of how this works. The patients do have, I have to talk to them and be satisfied that they know there's a hip resurfacing, there's a hip replacement, and what the pros and cons of each are. If you have a hip resurfacing, for instance, you still have your natural hip, you can have a standard hip fracture. If you have a replacement operation, the typical hip fracture you can't have because you've got a metal part in the narrow area of your femur. So that's the difference between the two. Overall, the complication rates are slightly less over time with resurfacing because they have a, a much lower late failure rate because uh, they're a more natural way. And if there is any kind of failure, the failures are easier to deal with too. So overall, resurfacing is a, a little less complicated, but it presupposes it's done right and that the bone is good and that the implant is, uh, is the correct one and used in the correct way. So, so that, that last uh, thing is, is very important to me and I, I, I have to have an in-depth conversation with every one of my patients. They email me x-rays, they, they ask me to just make an opinion off an of x-ray uh, screen on my computer. I got to pick up the phone and talk to everyone of them first before we can settle on the, on the decision. So I did the first robotic hips that were done at our hospital. I went to San Francisco and trained on it. And I've used it uh, to the advantage of my patient and still do. Someone who has a hip that's so uh, malformed that I can't find another way uh, to, to see it and confirm that I'm doing the hip correctly, I, I absolutely want robotics. I see a role for it. But I'm a little worried about it uh, because robotic hips, in the end, they're aimed at trying to get you an average hip. That com this is a computer-driven process. So you take your, your patient's image, you put it in the computer, the computer ge generates your operative plan, and then you follow it, and it makes sure you do. So it's really great to keep you on track to make sure you do the hip exactly the way you plan to do it. The trouble is, it, it develops the plan, and it's going to give you a, a great hip, but it's going to get you an average hip done to the parameters that the software developers have decided are best for a hip. And I found that that's not at all the business I'm in with resurfacing. I'm taking your natural hip and restoring it to your natural better hip again. I'm not looking for um, an average hip. I'm looking for your hip and they're not the same thing. And we all know that average sizes when you buy anything or see anything they don't fit anybody just quite right. So I'm in the personalized uh, medicine business. People talk about that for cancer therapies and things like that now, because that's another example of how different people can be. So I want, um, I'll use robotics, uh, I think when it gets better and, and more extended, and, and maybe we can have uh, some, some more software development. I'll, I'll see a role to help me do the operation, but I, 
I won't let the robot plan my operation. And so far, in a typical case, I can direct the way the surgery needs to go a, a little better uh, myself. So I use it in some cases where I, where I can't plan it uh, off the digital software that we have now. I have digital imaging in all my cases. We take digital images during the surgery. We can take an interoperative CT scan if we need it now. So I don't think robotics uh, have uh, replaced uh, technical skill and planning and know-how and is, is, is resulting in the perfect uh, hip resurfacing or perfect hip replacement, which is what we're all after. You know, the most thrilling uh, thing, and I, I never get tired of this question, even though it's a, it's a great question. People ask me, well, what can I do? And um, one of the ways patients build their trust with me is they, they come in and they sit down and they want to tell me about their life. And it, it, it makes me, uh, it's invigorating, because I get, to, everybody's different. And I'm, I'm seeing with people that are highly motivated, want to do something with their life. In fact, if they don't want to tell me about their life, I'm kind of wondering why they're there. Because, you know, I don't want to do a hip surgery for someone who just says they were sent in because somebody told them they had a bad looking x-ray. I'm not looking for, for that. That's not interesting. And I don't think I can help somebody with that. So activities are, are a huge reason to come see a doctor. And hopefully it's the, it's the main reason that they're there. And I want to hear from them what they can't do and what they want to get to. Uh, on their side of the equation, though, I can see by the way they're asking and the way they tell me things, they want to make sure they can get that. And they'll describe uh, a lifestyle, keep thinking they're going to stump me and have me say, I'm not going to let you do that. And I'll have patients talk for several minutes that they're going to do this and that. And uh, they can be a circus performer. I had a patient that wanted to play in the NBA and he did and he's he's currently an announcer for the team that he last played for and they'll just tell me anything they have a lifestyle that I'm looking up to I wish I had time and energy to do all their things and but the answer to that is there is no activity you can tell me and show me you can pick out your smartphone and show me all the pictures of things that you have done and want to do and I'm going to say yes to every one of them there isn't any limitation on it. When we ask our patients after, we find the same thing. We use the UCLA activity score, it's a zero to 10 score. We have patients all the time go all the way to the top, 10, elite athlete, Ironman. You, you, you name the activity, uh, we have a patient that can do it. Not every patient can do it uh, though, uh, but almost all can. And uh, sometimes they tell me it's because of me and I laugh. I tell them, I have a normal hip. I can't do what you just did. It's, it's, it, but it's good to know that what we've done isn't holding them back. Their hip no longer stops them from realizing their goals and dreams and, and taking full advantage of their abilities. And that, that's what we're, we're hoping to get and fortunately uh, usually do. It's a great uh, thrill in a number of ways to have uh, Dr. Fred Beagle as a, a patient because that's been the, this has been the hardest uh, thing. I, I don't know that I need recognition. I have, I'm happy for the patients that come to me and tell me that they uh, heard about me in some way, that they come and I get to treat them. That's a great uh, gift. Um, I've had a, um, a number of physicians and a good many orthopedic surgeons, and 36 in my career, which is now starting year 35. So pretty much every year, or sometimes one year I had, uh, I think three is the best uh, year on that. And it, only two others have ever done a hip resurfacing. And, and only Dr. Beagle has been willing to kind of go public with all this. 34 of the 36 um, do not offer hip resurfacing operations to their patients. When it came time for their hip, they saw value in it, but for different reasons, uh, for their patients, they, they didn't as much. And uh, there was uh, one time I was speaking at a program and, and the, one of the other speakers there w turned out to be one of my patients and he, uh, he was on the side of the debate, as it often comes up, suggesting that um, an anterior total hip was a far better operation than a hip resurfacing, and that's what he recommends to all his patients. And 
you know, naturally confidentiality being what it is. I just sat there and listened to him politely and he had a very nice presentation. And so if I had anything missing as far as um, feeling good about what I do, Fred Beagle's filled that hole in pretty well by willing to acknowledge that he, ha that he sees a role for hip resurfacing, say that he's had it now twice, and uh, he's uh, advancing the, the cause of, of what we're doing by uh, doing this and saying that he's done it and being willing to, to you know, kind of give up on a little of his privacy. It's not an easy thing to do. I, I don't know if I could do that, if, if I'd be willing to sh share a medical story or not. I, I hope I would, because it's, it's, it's a real um, valuable thing to do, and I'm, I'm pleased to be part of it. I'm also, I need uh, the motivation and energy. I'll be ready for his surgery just like I was uh, two and a half years ago, and I'm, I'm looking forward to another positive experience for both of us. How come you? Why do you see value in hip resurfacing and other doctors not, not so much? And, and it's, a, it's always a difficult question when you're comparing yourself in any way or commenting. And historically in medicine, we don't like to do that. And I know I don't. I think highly of every, every doctor. I'm very pro-physician, uh, have been my whole career. In fact, um, it's been said before, but I, I, I say it when I get people joining our clinic, that uh, I'm a physician first, last, and always. It means everything to, to me to be a doctor, and I think it does to most anybody else doing it. I don't have an MD and an MBA behind it or any other thing. Um, I. I when I treat my patients, uh, my sole compensation is their fee. I don't have any endorsement agreements from any companies relative to hip resurfacing implants. I don't sell or make hip resurfacing implants. I'm there to treat my patient. It's a completely transparent um, operation and, uh, to, to do for them, and it's fun to be part of the care. When I have to tell them about things they ask about other doctors, it gets a little tough. So I tell them just kind of the basics. I said, well, you know, there's practical considerations. This is a hard operation to do. And it's a hard one to learn. And in the end, you have another great operation as an alternative. So every doctor learns in their training how to do a hip replacement, and they can do it well, and it's going to work. So why look past that? And, and in the end, that's the, the real answer. You don't need to look past it. A few patients. The ones I described earlier that have needs beyond a hip replacement make some sense. But it, it's not going anywhere uh, uh, economically because it's the same professional fee, it's the same billing code, it's the same everything. There's nothing driving this on the surgeon part. And in the end, who of us want a harder way to, to do the very same thing and who wants to spend longer Certainly talking to a patient, planning the operation is definitely going to be longer. Maybe the doing of it not so much longer now with better techniques. But again, there, it, my practice here, would they would love it if I'd give it up. I could move faster and we're busy enough. We could just do other, treat a few more patients. We'd be better off to do it. So the, so the, the doing of it is just practically hard to do. It's also hard to get the implants we need. We need all the different implants to match every patient. The medical industry has not been supportive of resurfacing at all. Uh, drug, imp drug companies, implant vendors, those are stock for profit companies. They like to make things they can sell and that they can sell easily uh, with good returns for their stockholders. Resurfacing implants are not those products. They're hard to make. They're hard to sell at, at any premium because hospitals don't want to pay more for a resurfacing implant than a total hip and they usually won't. So there isn't that good economic return. That's a, a barrier to doing it a, as well. So it's a difficult operation. There's some economic constraints. Um, you also uh, talk to a lot of patients that's not appropriate for them. You, some 80-year-old person comes in, wants the hip resurfacing. You gotta be polite and tell them it's, it's not good. They'll argue back. It's not always a bowl of cherries saying no, and you have to say that. Uh, hip replacement, you can say yes to everybody, pretty much. So there's some practical constraints that have uh, slowed this down. Unfortunately, the fact that it works well is the only driver that keeps it going. I, I know that's all that's driven Fed, Fred Beagle. <laughs> He's been at this. And it, look, we're not popular at meetings. 
I don't, I don't see my calendar lining up with a bunch of speaking engagements, and I don't think Fred's Beagle's ever had two. And he's a very famous guy; he's written a lot of papers <laughs> and a book on this subject. Everybody knows him, but I don't. He's, he doesn't get dialed up to come tell us all about hip resurfacing. It, it isn't something that people see a lot in, and patients do, but the, the rest of medicine not so much. No, it's uh, a clear. Uh, so, and the, com the, the paired bilateral comparison group, the 270 patients that we've had, all with have good follow-ups, uh, equal in every other way. 89% of the patients preferred the hip resurfacing side. Among their two, admittedly, good hips. They have a, a, a very, you know, 90 plus Harris hip score on each hip, but among their two good hips, the resurfaced hip was preferred by 89% of the patient. And then the others were split between didn't have a preference and a few did prefer the total hip. I'm glad there were some of those because then you'd say, well, maybe this isn't a good way to do it if it just sort of came out all one way. But I think there's some, and the statisticians that uh, I consulted trying to find out a power analysis, we needed a lot of cases. And there was a time when I wasn't sure I was gonna get there. Because in my practice, people do want resurfacing uh, cases. And the reasons that they didn't get them sometimes were there wasn't an implant available, uh, there used to be some insurance barriers, why they couldn't have it on one side. Um, so, a few just didn't, didn't have good enough bone, say, on one side. There were different reasons why it wasn't uh, done, but it was a, a pretty uh, profound, and that's uh, highly statistically significant. Um, it's very unusual in, in our profession. If you look at other studies, the prevalence uh, in a patient choice study is um, really not to that degree. There's a lot of science, economic theory, has a lot of scientific methods where they look at these preferences and look at and other consumable items that people get and, and, and trying to get at, you know, measuring these things is difficult. So there, there, the statistical consultants that I used sort of guided this and what kind of questions to ask and how much data to have and, and trying to see, is there a valid uh, w way? I, I think, in my view, I did the same kind of work on the knee many years ago to try to get at this, and it was, and it, it was pretty useful. It, um, I'm still asked to speak on that, and I, I think this is going to uh, resonate to some degree uh, w with patients who want to know this answer. Not everybody wants it. Yes, the, the shortest follow-up is two years because you can't, so the follow-up period, like any scientific uh, validity, and certainly for resurfacing, and total hip too, you can't really have an outcome in, in less than two years and be, be sure about it. Is that really meaningful? So everyone had at least two. Uh, and uh, No, we had uh, cases well past uh, 20 years in that series, a compared series, I think it went all the way out to 26. The average uh, number of years, though, was in double digits. So it was over 10 years in, in follow-up. So it, it was, uh, and I, I looked at that, too, because people are going to ask that, and I'm, I'm, I'm now calling through that answer, too, is does it change over time? Because a lot of people, you know, it was a short-term follow-up, say, well, maybe that's true at two years, but does it really matter at 10 or 20? And we also looked at uh, failure rates over time because we we could, and sure enough, some of the total hips at lengthy uh, follow-up, you, you know, if you follow them later, uh, th there's a higher failure rate in this paired bilateral comparison study. Also, in the total hip group, if you follow them long enough, so the the the, the number it is a long-term study. Uh, the preferences are consistent. They're true at two years. They're true at five years, they're true at 10 years. They're still true at 20 years, uh, typically, if you have your patient around. The surgical approach is, is a, something patients ask a lot about now, and surgeons uh, historically, too. And there are many good approaches into the hip. I've used, in my career, four and seen value in all four. And I used the direct anterior for the first 20 years, 21 years of my career more than all others because I felt it was a more stable hip. 
less chance of a dislocation. For resurfacing, that turns out not to matter, and I figured that out because I've, I don't have my hip resurfacing patients get dislocations anyway, regardless of approach. So I, I, didn't, I don't use it as much now because that was its very distinct advantage, and it's, it is an important advantage for a hip replacement. There, there's drawbacks to each approach as well as benefits, and um, Dr. Beagle mentioned lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and then my wife's a plastic surgeon, as I mentioned. She kind of shrinks from a direct entry. So you put an incision right on the front of somebody's hip where they can just look down and see it whenever they want. And you can imagine how a plastic surgeon feels about that. They put your facelift incision behind your ear where nobody can see it. So you would never make an incision right where you can easily see it, the person themselves. So there, there's always different permutations. I was uh, really gifted uh, in life to start practice with Dr. John Clark. He was a PhD in anatomy and in the 1980s was looking at good ways to uh, approach a hip. He settled on what uh, we later called the superior approach and it's, it's a variation. It's kind of between the lateral and the posterior approach. It's, it's a kind of a pretty straight lateral skin incision. It takes a, a pretty elegant seam in the gluteus and for resurfacing you've, you've got to get to the top of the hip uh, to, to get access for the femoral side. And you've got to get uh, down uh, also fairly low to get a good access point for the correct angle of the hip socket because the femoral head's in your way. If you remove the femoral head, well, you can use a curved instrument or get to the socket without much stress. So we need to get down basically where the gluteal tendon attaches to the femur at the bottom. We need to be on the top to go directly down on the femoral head. And it, and when I'm doing these surgeries, I'm trying to make the incision the best way to facilitate that, but, but also uh, make it reasonably cosmetic in the way we close it and the way it heals is also important too. The length of the incision is not important. It, there's no relationship at all to length of an incision and recovery or any other known um, issue. We don't make it unnecessarily long. Uh, years ago, we made incisions long to get light into the wound. We don't have to do that now. We've got good lighting in our ORs, but we just make it long enough so there's not tension on the incision, so it'll heal properly, it'll allow us the access that we need. And, um, and when I'm doing these surgeries, I, I, it's very important to get the uh, surgical approach because you're going to probably get everything else you need. The bone will take care of itself um, pretty darn well. And um, in fact, that's an area uh, I'll comment on too, bone health. We live in a, a, a gifted time right now. You can make all the bone you want with a couple bone building drugs that are available. So, so we're, we're, we're doing better on our bone health, but we still have to do good surgery and we have to have a good exposure, good healing for our patient and good functional outcome later. It's all gonna depend on how, how, what we don't injure. The Mayo Clinic took this on. They uh, did a very elegant study where they decided, you know, on surgical approach, it's not what you cut and sew entirely. It's also what you pull on and stretch. And there's other forms of injury. And if you put someone on a, in a HANA table and put their leg in traction, pull on it hard, well, you're pulling things too. And we're pretty cognizant of that in the surgery too. So there's what you cut and sew and retract and pull and push on. And, and it all goes into the mix. And in the end, the, the surgery is about best we can try to limit the, the, the traumatic uh, event that it is. And a lot of that has to do with the anesthesia too and how we talk to the patients and encourage them later.